coming and this morning we're going to begin uh, uh, in just a few minutes we're going to start talking about prayer so we're going to um, we're going to catch up with just a few things and then move on into prayer but we want to be talking about how we grow and by way of reminder two weeks ago when we were looking at this we talked about the environment for growth we've talked about the nutrient one of the nutrients that we must have if we are going to grow and we're going to review just a little bit this morning but I want to remind you of what I reminded the first group the first service as well as we look at growth and how we grow and why we should grow it's good to remind ourselves it's not just something we should do it's not just oh okay I should grow but because I'm a Christian but it is part it is God's plan for your life when God shined his light in your life when he brought you out of darkness when he broke the chains that held you bondage you wanted to get free you could not free yourself some of you lived in fear and you were fearful all the time what about this or what about that and then Jesus came into your life and you realized and you saw I don't have to be afraid because he holds my tomorrows some of you grappled with and struggled with thoughts of suicide I know that in any any time there's a group like this I you'd, you'd struggled with thoughts of suicide and he set you free from that he comes into our lives and he changes us and I think a lot of times as Christians we start we it's easy to think praise the Lord I'm not going to hell I'm going to heaven and and that's true and that is wonderful that's wonderful you know I was talking with brother Keith at, at water baptism on Friday and as I've gotten older and as I pray for people especially people that are are close to death or very very elderly one of my prayers often is Lord don't let them die and go to hell Lord don't let them die and go to hell give them a chance because that's for eternity that's for eternity there's a there's an old old lady in the village where I live in Taipo she doesn't speak any English at all she doesn't even speak Cantonese I think she's she's Hakka as far as I know and she really is she looks like she's about a hundred years old and I, I try to I've tried to share with her I can't she just looks at me and I think I've shared some of that before but one of my prayers for her has been because she's very very old as far as I know she lives alone um, and my prayer has been Lord don't let her die and go to hell Lord help her to know you help her to come to salvation but brothers and sisters God has more for us than saving us from hell he does as wonderful as that is and it is wonderful to think that you and I because Jesus came into our lives and because we said yes to him and because we're following him for all eternity all eternity you and I will be in heaven with the Lord who loves us and saved us instead of hell with the devil who captured us and slaved us and hates us it's gonna be great it's gonna be great it's a great salvation it's a wonderful rescue and it is it was a rescue wasn't it in our lives it was a rescue and some of us probably because of our lives we feel that and we know that more than others um, a little bit like the story that we were sharing on the beach um, the the Bali nine that we've if you've been watching in the news and I didn't know until until Keith told me about it that the two of the ringleaders from Australia that they executed Keith said he was just praying for them as he heard about it and I know there's been a lot in the world about human rights and 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 executions and I know that those things are part of it but his prayer was as I'm sure many was God give them a chance let them know you and then it came out after the execution that in those 10 years that they were in prison that the ringleader of the drug gang and the other one came to the Lord that they were Christians and that he was the pastor in the prison and praise the Lord for that and then the others who the all, I think all of them are all almost all of them professed a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that the last song they sang the songs that they sang before they were amazing grace and um, bless the Lord oh my soul brothers and sisters if if all that God does for us 
is salvation from hell, a rescue from hell. That is a great thing, and it's a wonderful thing. But do you know what? God has much, much more for us than that. Much, much more for us from, than that. And that's why we're looking at this, and that's why we're talking about how we grow and why we grow. Because when God saw you and came into your life, His plan for you and His plan for me is the restoration and the recovery of all that the devil and sin has destroyed and damaged in our lives. When Jesus came and He announced and He declared to everyone, I have come that you might have life and that you might have what? Abundant life, or as one translation says, life to the full. That's what another translation says. It is more than one day in the future I will be in heaven instead of hell. God is at work in our lives to restore what the devil has destroyed, to give back what the devil has stolen, to remake us in the image of God. That was His plan for you in the beginning. When God made man in the beginning, what does it say in, in Genesis? God made man and woman. How did He make them? Three words, that's right. In His image. In His image. And then through disobedience and rebellion, man fell. And the image of God was destroyed in God's creation. And God has come into our lives to restore His image in you and in me. And that is why, brothers and sisters, when we look at this and we look at the Word of God, it's not just a pragmatic, practical, we should grow because we're Christians, we should do this. It is that we fit into and we cooperate with and we grow and we fit with the very plan of God from the beginning. From the beginning, He made men, He made women, He made them in His image and in His likeness. And He did that, that man and woman created might have a relationship with the one who made them, might have a relationship with the one who gave them life and breathed life. And brothers and sisters, when you and I begin again, that relationship with God. And we say, yes, God, come into my life. Yes, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. It is more than delivered from hell and on my way to heaven. It is a relationship with God. It's restoring communion. It's restoring fellowship. It's restoring the image of God in us. And when at one time you could have no communication with the Holy God because you and I were sinful and broken and fallen, we now have open access to a holy God and He restores in us His image. He makes us again into who and what He knows we can be. Who and what He created us to be. And that is why, that is why when we, when we grow and how we grow, we are cooperating. We are working with God so that His purposes might be fulfilled. His plan, His image might be restored in our lives. Can we be baby, baby, baby Christians and make it to heaven? Sure. Sure. But why would you want to remain a baby Christian when God has so much more for you? When Jesus says, I've come to give you abundant life. Abundant life. Life to the full. Me? I finally decided I want life to the full. Don't you? And so this is how we grow. This is why we grow. This is why we grow. Two weeks ago when we looked at this, we looked at Colossians 3, 16 and 2 Corinthians 13. Let's look at those again. And we talked about, we've talked about the nutrient for growth, which is the Word of God. That's one of the nutrients. And then we talked about the environment for growth. And here's the environment. And we looked at that, the environment. Let's look at it again just as a reminder, but this is so important for us. Let the message of Christ in all its richness, because there's so much there, let it dwell in you, okay? Or let it dwell in you richly, some translations say. Let it fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom He gives. You know, sometimes I think we think, oh, only the pastors, only the, te only the teachers, they can, they can teach us. The Bible 
absolutely does not say that. The Bible does give pastors and teachers, but then in all the other places it also says we teach and we counsel one another. And that's why it's so important that you and I, if we're going to grow, we have the environment of fellowship. We have the environment of relationship. And that's not just a pastor saying, you should come to church. Forgive us if the pastors sometimes sound like, where were you? We missed you. We weren't in church. We love you and we want you to be in church. That's the place, that's the place where God has, in church or in fellowship, let me put it that way. I don't want to just say you have to be here in fellowship and relationship with Christians on a, on a regular basis. That's God's plan. That's God's, that's, that's how God, that's his design for us. That's his design for us. The great John Wesley, John and Charles Wesley, the great John Wesley said, the most, un, there's nothing more unchristian than a solitary Christian. Let me say that one more time. John Wesley said, there's nothing more unchristian than a solitary Christian than a solitary Christian. God has designed us to be in families. If you look at the early church, if you look at the early church, you will see the church that meets in the house of. They met together continually. When they got together, you know, for us on Sunday, on the first Sunday of the month, we share communion together. And that is, the Bible does not say the first Sunday of the month. Many churches do that. Um, but there's nothing in the Bible that says do it on the first Sunday of the month. This is just the pattern that we have at Lighthouse. Some churches have share the Lord's Supper every week. And there, there are many churches that do that. Others maybe once every few months or, or, or something like that. But you know in the early church, do you know what they would do when they had communion? If you look at the picture in the New Testament, this is what you always see in the early days. In the early days. It was always, they would share, they would have communion, uh, the Lord's Supper, but they would always have a meal with it, an agape feast or a love feast. They would literally, they would share food together, not, not just bread and juice because there was fellowship and they fellowship together it was their it was their lives um, and I, lighthouse is pretty good at that I think but there's all but there's always as we look at this there's there's always a place where Lord I need to grow more in this area and so this is the picture this is the picture that we see and I gave the example in the first service and I want to to mention it again here because all of you know I use a lot of gardening examples because I like to garden and I like to grow flowers and uh, I learned a lesson early on when I was gardening I, I know brother a, a brother Andrew's smiling because he does it too you know he posts pictures of all his flowers at Lonke, right and other places and I'm, I'm always jealous brother Andrew in America when somebody is a very good gardener we always say that he or she has a green thumb do you say that in Cantonese and if, and if somebody can't grow things you know what we say they have a black thumb <laughs> in other words it makes them die <laughs> we, we make things die and um, so I don't know what you, I don't know if you say it in Cantonese or not you don't right I like that though it's green because you make things grow but uh, I used to buy seed packets in the US and then I'd come back to Hong Kong and I'd plant them in the garden and oh I love to see them grow and then there were some I'd plant them and I'd look and look and nothing happened and I'd given some seeds to my landlady uh, I, brought, I bought the packets in the US and we looked at it carefully my sister helped me choose and we came back and um, about a week or so ago my landlady looked in her garden you know what she told me she said your seeds are no good <laughs> <laughs> because none of them had sprouted none of them had come up and I said but I said I think they're good seeds she said they're not suitable maybe they're not suitable for Hong Kong I, said, I think so I think so so I said let me see the packet so she gave me the packet back and I looked at the back and the problem was she hadn't followed all the directions on the back and she hadn't seen that uh, it takes to germinate it would take a, at least three weeks for this particular type to germinate and I used to do the same thing as well I brought some seeds back I planted them and I thought oh I couldn't wait for the flowers to spring forth in the garden and nothing ever happened and I thought what went wrong and then I looked at the back of the packet and I found out that I had bought seeds and planted them in Hong Kong and on the back of the packet it said suitable for a cool environment <laughs> I, the problem was there was nothing wrong with the seed I didn't give it the right environment 
I didn't give it the right environment. And brothers and sisters, and, and all sorts of seeds, parsley seeds, you have to soak them. Some seeds you put in the refrigerator. Some seeds should be dark. Some seeds you don't even put under the ground. You sprinkle them on top and they'll sprout because they need light. But you need to know what the right environment, environment is for growth. And just as that is true in the natural, brothers and sisters, it's true in the spiritual. And the best environment for growth, one of the best, is, for, for the Christian, is fellowship. Let's look at the next one. Okay? So spiritual growth, it thrives. Your spiritual life will thrive in the environment of fellowship and relationship. Okay? And I've given you this scripture, Hebrews 10, 25, which we looked at last time. It thrives. That's when it does the best. Now, I'll be really honest with you. It's not always easy that way. Because when I'm near you and when you're near me, guess what you find out about me? I'm not perfect. I sometimes get impatient. I sometimes rub you the wrong way and you rub me the wrong way. But that is how we grow. That's how we grow. If I'm around people that, oh, yes, anything, yes, pastor, yes, pastor, yes, pastor, I will, I will grow very little. But I'm around others who are imperfect just as I am imperfect. And we grow together. We grow together. And that's why we've got to have grace for, for one another, right? We've got to have grace for one another. Because if we don't have grace, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. And so we provide the environment, the environment of fellowship and relationship. And that's how we go and we grow. And, that, and we talked about this before. Uh, can you grow by yourself apart from other Christians? Sure you can. You can. And there are some people for, for, circ for certain reasons in their lives or in their families, they'll be isolated at times from other Christians. But I want to encourage you in this area. God has designed the greatest blessing for your Christian life and my Christian life in the context of fellowship. And that's why we want to keep praying for Vicki, that Vicki is able to come and be part of the fellowship on Sundays. God answered that prayer for Melrose many, many years ago when she had to work on Sundays and she could only come on Wednesday evenings. And she said, God, I want to be part of the church fellowship at other times. And God made a way. So we keep on praying for Vicki as well. And it's God's plan. It's God's plan for us to be in fellowship. And we will receive the greatest blessing. But I want to tell you one other thing. The other part of that, as, far as, as well as receiving blessing, is that you will be a blessing to others as well. You will be a blessing. How many of you sometimes feel like, I'm not a blessing? Do you ever feel that way? <laughs> Thank you. Steve raised his hand. <laughs> a lot of us raised our hands. We sometimes feel like I, I'm not a blessing. Well, well, brother Joshing, that's the second time that that's the second time that happened. <laughs> it happened in the first service too, except it was the bass guitar and it was really loud. But you know, that's okay. He'll get. We're blessed, brother Joshing. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for playing this morning. We appreciate that. We appreciate that. The Lord gives us gifts and talents, every one of us. You say, I don't feel like that. I really struggle in some areas. Well, you talk to God about it. God's Word says you have gifts and talents that He has given you for other people in the church. I didn't say that. God said it. I didn't give you a gift. God gave you a gift. I didn't say, here, you do this. No. God gave you gifts. He has given you gifts for your brothers and sisters. And when we isolate ourselves from our Christian brothers and our sisters, we deprive them. They don't get the blessing of the gifts and the encouragements that God wants to flow through us to them. I really mean that. So I was thinking about Friday when we had the water baptism. Very simple. Those of you who were baptized, most of you, you are baby Christians. Baby Christians? Baby. A Anna said, yes, baby Christians. May I tell you something? I've been a Christian. Pastor Anae has been a Christian for many, many years now, for more than 40 years. May I tell you something? Friday, as we were together under that tree, and we heard your testimonies, and we saw your joy, may I tell you what happened to my heart? Brother Stephen, did you feel the same way? 
all the rest of us that have been Christians along? Did you feel the same way? Was your heart just filled with joy? Were you encouraged as you heard these testimonies and you saw the joy and the, the freshness of the testimony, right? The freshness. Because sometimes I've been a Christian a long time and sometimes it doesn't always feel so fresh, right? And so to see young Christians like, oh, Jesus, you did this. Oh, it's like just it breathes fresh life into my life again. And so you blessed me, a baby Christian. I'm the pastor. And it brought blessing. That's the blessing of being in fellowship and in relationship in the family of God. Because He gives us gifts to bless and to encourage our brothers and our sisters, every one of us. This morning, if you're here, I don't care how old you are as a Christian. I don't care how weak you are as a Christian. It does not matter what you know or don't know yet about the Word of God. God has given you gifts and encouragements for everybody else here at Lighthouse. You may not recognize it yet. You may not know it yet. But you ask God, you be faithful, and you will see your life and your words bless and encourage others. Amen? Amen. 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 And so the environment for growth is in fellowship with other believers. I shared in the first service that very often as I drive to church or as I drive to, to services or gatherings of Christians, I have begun to pray a prayer that I didn't used to pray when I was a younger pastor even, or even a younger Christian. But very often now, as I know I'm going to meet with other Christians, in addition to other praying that I do at home or in preparation, one of my prayers for myself and for you is this. Lord, give me words to say to encourage people today. Lord, fill my, fill, fill my heart and fill my mouth with messages from you and with words from you. Lord, give me grace for others. Help your grace to flow through me. Lord, may my life be a blessing to people today. And you know what? I pray that for you as well. In fact, I don't know if a Sunday goes by that I don't pray that for Lighthouse, whether I'm preaching or not. As I drive in, that's one of my prayers. God, bless your people today. And Lord, fill them with, with wisdom. Lord, Lord, fill them with encouragements. Lord, may they bless each other, one another. Lord, may they encourage their brothers and their, their sisters this morning as they gather together. Lord, put extra love in their hearts and may that love overflow to the people that they're around today. I pray that for you because that's God's pattern and that's God's plan. And you pray that for yourself and you pray that for others as well and we will see a difference in how we interact with people. And people will come to us and they will say, it blessed me so much when you said that. Thank you for... And you may say, what? I, I didn't even... You may not even have felt spiritual when you said it. You may have just been saying something. But somebody will say, you blessed me with that. I needed to hear that. And you see, brothers and sisters, that is part of being in the family of God. And we miss that. And we lose that if we're not in fellowship with others. So, Amen. 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 So we look at the next one. We want to go on. So the environment for growth is in fellowship with other believers. And then I didn't get to this part in the second service two weeks ago. I did in the first service. You know, uh, both services are, are, each service is always just a little bit different each time. So we didn't get this far. But this is where we see another environment optimum environment for growth. And this was written by James, inspired by the Holy Spirit. James, who is the half-brother, who was the half-brother of Jesus. So, so practical. If James were preaching in a church today, people would get their toes stepped on all the time. He was so direct, wasn't he? He, he wasn't very gentle in how he said things, but really inspired of the Holy Spirit. And let's look at what James says here, and we'll see the other environment for growth. Um, James says, don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For you, if you listen to the Word and you don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself. You walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Now remember, keep that up there and think on that just a minute. We've also looked at 
uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, where it says that uh, every the Word of God is useful for this and this and this and this in our lives. And remember what it says in 2 Timothy 3, 16? It says... It shows us what is wrong in our lives. I should have put it back up. I took it out of the I took it out of the lineup, but it shows us what is wrong in our lives and helps us to do what is right. That's my rough translation. And I thought about that. That's exactly what James is saying here, right? What do you do when you look in a mirror, a, a physical mirror? Do you just look in the mirror to say, "Oh, wa holenga." Wow. I Unless we're really, unless we are really, really proud. <laughs> you know, we, do we just look, we say, oh, I just, I look so good. <laughs> My grandfather, who is with the Lord now, really, uh, he was a, a, a spirit-filled Christian doctor, but he really also believed in saying good things. And, and he believed really in the power, the power of really saying positive things. And every morning he would get up, and he would look in the mirror, and you know what he would say to himself? This was as a Christian Dr. Spiritfield. He was, he was German, Sister Lisa. You, you, you've read the book, right? He would look in the mirror, and he would look at himself, and he would say, Every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. <laughs> Even though Grandpa was getting older and more wrinkled and a little bit fatter and a little bit grayer every day. But, the, but it was every day in every way I'm getting better and better. And, and actually, the Bible does confirm that. Paul says, though outwardly we are wasting away, inward, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. But we look in a mirror physically to make sure everything is okay, don't we? We look in the mirror to, oh, make sure your, if your hair's sticking up, you comb it. If it's this or that, I've got to fix my makeup, or there's this or that. And we use the mirror primarily. The mirror makes correct. We use it to make corrections, right? It's a tool to, make, to help us make corrections. And that's a physical example, really, of what James is saying here. So Paul says it in 2 Timothy. It, it shows us what is wrong. And so when we come to the Word of God, and then we look at what James says here, the half-brother of Jesus, and he says, you, you, you must do what it says. You, otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. You've like, you glance at your face in the mirror. And he, so he says, if we don't make the changes that are needed, we're fooling ourselves. We won't be blessed by that. And so the picture that we have here, the other environment for optimum growth as a Christian is obedience to the Word of God. It's just very simple obedience. I'm sorry, you wanted a great secret that was really exciting, didn't you? Not very exciting, but it's the truth and it's necessary. It's a step of obedience. And as you come to the Word of God, and as you obey, as you obey, and some of us will say, yeah, but Pastor Jennifer, there's so much in the Word of God. How do I know which way to, how do I know what to do? How do I know, how can I pay attention to everything? Don't worry about that. Instead, keep reading the Word, keep praying, and be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Guess what the Holy Spirit will do in your life? We all know what He'll do, won't He? There will be an area of our life that is out of order. It's not in line with God and His Word. And you don't have to have anybody else tell you. And you don't have to read a book about it. The Holy Spirit will start speaking to you. He'll start dealing with that in your life. And He'll start giving you opportunities for obedience. For, for obedience. And then out of obedience comes change. Out of obedience ch comes change. And out of obedience and change, the change is growth. The change is growth. If we resist, we won't grow. How many of you, and let me encourage you in this rather than discourage you, how many of you can look to something in your life, an area where at one time in your life you used to struggle with obedience in a particular area and you no longer struggle? Yes? Can you think of that? Okay, sure, all of us can. And if I were to ask you, who knows what you'd tell me? It might be something outwardly that people could see. 
It might be something inward, inwardly, an attitude or whatever, but there would be something in your life and in my life, an area where we used to struggle with obedience, where it was really hard in that area, where I wanted to do what my flesh wanted to do. Maybe that's the easiest way to put it, right? My flesh wanted to do it, and usually I'd struggle a little bit, but I'd follow my flesh because it felt so good to say yes to the flesh at the moment. And then after that, you know, you know the cycle, don't you? I'd feel guilty, and God forgive me, and, but I kept on giving in to the flesh. And then the time comes when the Holy Spirit keeps working and we start saying yes to the Holy Spirit. And when we say yes, then we start to obey. And after a while, the area of struggle becomes quite easy to us, doesn't it? Or it becomes much easier. Becomes much easier. Why? We've obeyed enough. Listen. And this is, and we'll talk more about this next week. We've obeyed enough in that area so that the Holy Spirit has helped us to develop godly patterns in our lives in that area. And we start growing in that area. And then we keep on going. But guess what? Because we never stop growing, we will come up to new areas of obedience. New areas of obedience. May I uh, let me share something with you. May I share with you personally? Yes, I'm going to share with you personally. In my life, areas of struggle with sin, 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 things like that, I, I, don't, I don't struggle a lot in sort of you know, easy areas of sin, if you want to think about it in that way. I've been a Christian a long time. I'm not boasting. I'm just giving my, my testimony. I've walked with the Lord a long time. Sister Lisa would say the same thing. Pastor, and all of us who have been Christians for a long time, in general, we would say that as we walk with the Lord. But I do struggle in other areas. As I've walked with the Lord in obedience, then other areas become areas where am I going to obey or am I not going to obey? Am I going to grow or not grow? And for me, one of the areas that I need to grow more in is in time management. Very simply. And you say, time management, oh, Sister Jennifer, you're not struggling with this or this or this or this. It's a struggle for me to discipline myself in the area of time management so that I can use my time for more productive things in the Lord. In the Lord, okay? So I'm... I need to grow in that area, and I'm working on that with the help of the Holy Spirit. But as we say yes to the Holy Spirit, He helps us to grow. He helps us, and we grow beyond that. And then those things in the past, oh, they become much easier, but God moves us on to other things. How many of you were baptized in water on Friday? Raise your hands. Yes? Okay. Raise, okay, you raised your hands, you were baptized in water. When you were baptized in water on Friday, you took a step of... Obedience. Obedience. Some of you, it may have been a very easy step. Some of you, it may have been a difficult step, right? Especially if you came from a background. Maybe some of you said, I was baptized as a child, and it was really a struggle for you. You said, but why do I have to be baptized again? Why should I be baptized again? I've been baptized as a child. Why, why should I? There's, there's no need for it. And then as you studied Scripture, and as the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart, and life, you began to see I should obey in this area. How many of you, let me ask you just a minute, anybody, not just those that were, that were baptized on Friday, think back when you were baptized in water, if that was a hard step of obedience for you, would you raise your hand? It was a difficult step. Anybody? Jonalyn? Most of, okay. Esther? A few of us? Okay. Christy? A few of us, it was, it was a hard step of obedience. It, it really meant something. I told the story in the, first, uh, in the first service of a young man many years ago in Singapore. He was a Muslim. His name was Sammy. And he became a Christian uh, through mom and dad, through the church in Singapore. And you know, Singapore still is, but at that time, it was very, very multicultural with very strong ethnic groups. And um, in the early years, there was a lot of, uh, uh, there were race riots in Singapore. There was a lot of division between different groups. And Sammy became a Christian. And his family was Muslim. He was only 17 years old. And he wanted to be baptized. 
and I didn't share all of the story in the first, I think to keep him from being baptized, to discourage him, his family hired somebody to beat him up. And it wasn't just a black eye. They beat him up so badly he couldn't walk. It was, it was because the family, to, to them, they would rather have him dead than be a Christian. They were very strong, very, very strong. And they said, We'd rather, rather you be dead than to be a Christian. And Sammy wanted to be baptized. He wanted to be baptized. And that was always a huge step, especially in Singapore, coming from a non-Christian background in that time. So it was a huge step of obedience. And so Sammy, but Sammy was baptized. And his family thought, what will we do? The Muslim family thought, what will we do? And then they hired someone to kidnap him and put him on a small island outside of Singapore so that he was away from all the Christians. Because they thought, if we can get him away from the Christians, he will go back to being a Muslim. He will turn his back on Jesus. He'll be discouraged. He won't, he won't, he can't, he won't be around other Christians. And he'll give up his faith. And he'll come back to being a Muslim. And so um, they, he was kidnapped. And mom and dad didn't know what had happened to him. He just disappeared. He wasn't in the church. And they had no way of knowing what had happened. They didn't know where he was, no way to contact him, didn't know anything. And then sometime later after that, I think it was maybe several months, he came back and he told them the story. So his family had kidnapped him, hired somebody to kidnap him. They put him on this island and that was only a Muslim island. There were no churches on the island, no Christians on the island. It was a Muslim island. Uh, out somewhere on the, uh, the, around Singapore. And so one morning he got up and he was praying on the island and he walked out to the beach. He wanted to be private so he could pray. And as he walked out, he saw an elderly Chinese man seated on the beach on a rock reading something. And so Sammy walked up to him and he said, what are you reading? And the elderly Chinese man said, I'm reading a Bible. And in this whole island, here was this elderly Chinese man who loved God and knew God and was reading a Bible. And what his family had intended for evil and for ill, God took him to a place where without persecution, without distraction, he could learn the Bible and study the Bible with this elderly Chinese man. And that's so, we listen to that story, it's a true story. You will meet Sammy in heaven one day. You'll meet him in, in heaven. I'm sorry, Gwen looked at me. He's killed. I don't know. You won't meet him now. He's in Singapore. <laughs> Gwen's eyes got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. As far as I know, he's still alive. But you will meet him in heaven one day because he obeyed the Lord. And I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, as we obey God will bless our obedience. And obedience will sometimes be very costly. It really will. Sometimes when obedience is easy, we may not grow a lot. But when obedience costs us something, that's when we grow. And God blessed Sammy and brought him to a place where he could grow. Where he could grow. I want to tell you something. If you determine, listen carefully, if you determine to obey God in the area of your life that is difficult. Because I know this morning there are some of you that are struggling with obedience in some areas of your life. It's not because somebody said you should do this. Who cares? When somebody else tells us that it just makes us mad, right? Mind your own business. It does. We don't like that. But when the Holy Spirit talks to us, it's different. And what I want to say to you is this. If you will obey in the area where you are struggling this morning, and you know the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about this area, I promise you, not based on, oh, because of what I said, but because of God's promise, He will help you, strengthen you, bless you and give you grace to obey and to thrive in that area of obedience that you think it's going to kill you. If you will do it, you will be blessed. If you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, God will bless you. God will bless you for doing it. I promise you that.
That's a good word from the Lord, isn't it? It's true. It's true. Oh, this is the real time. Thank you, Pastor Renee. I didn't know that. I was looking at that and thinking, great, I've got six more minutes. Let's close with that next slide, then we close. Time to stop. Prayer. So we close with this. Spiritual growth requires the environment of obedience and it thrives in the environment of relationship and fellowship. I think in the second service, in the first service we started talking about prayer, so you can get up with other people, but we'll get to prayer as well. But I, I believe for this group, this second gathering, the, the, the underlined word of the Lord, message of the Lord for you this morning, is to be willing to take a step of obedience in faith. It will be costly, but it will be worth it. And you will succeed in God and not fail. You will succeed in God and not fail. Let's close in prayer. Hallelujah. Lord, we come to you this morning. God, we want to grow, not just because, well, that's what we should do, but because, God,